Thank you for joining us and for watching the CBSN original Speaking Frankly, Raising Boys. I'm Tanya Rivero. Wade Davis is a former NFL defensive back. After the conclusion of his career, Wade came out as gay, and now he travels speaking about race, gender, and orientation inequality. In addition, Davis is the NFL's first ever LGBT inclusion consultant. I spoke with him about what he calls the mask of masculinity. So Wade, when you talk about the mask of masculinity, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that um, that there is a performance that we as men some, some sometimes do, right? And the performance is trying to hide who we really are behind a mask of the stereotypical ways that men have been conditioned to show up. So that's with violence, that's, uh, you know, always kind of talking about women. And that wasn't who I was. So I was wearing a mask of someone else. I was wearing the idea of what a man should be instead of ever kind of stepping back and defining what a man meant alone. And so, and that's not just because you are gay, that is because there are values that you think that young men are missing, right? Yeah, you, you know, um, I think about it from this perspective, right? That as a young boy, I was never given women as role models, right? So I wasn't given books to read about girls. I wasn't educated to think of women as leaders, as captains of industry, right? So it frames how you think of women, but it also frames how you think about yourself as a man, right? And I wasn't taught to be hyper-compassionate. I wasn't taught to be emotional. I was taught to be one type of way that 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 I thought was the way to show myself as having value but all of those other ways of comporting myself had value as well but they were juxtaposed against what it meant to be a woman and if I was going to be a, a man I had to distance myself as far as I could from what it might have meant to be a, a girl or a woman. So let's talk about sports. You of course played in the NFL and now you consult with the league on diversity and inclusion. Tell us exactly what you're doing in that role. What does that entail? Yeah, so so it means that I get the privilege of going to locker rooms to talk to players, to coaches, to referees, to owners, to talk about how do you, you know, change the culture of sports that would be welcoming for individuals who identify as gay. So that means that I do a 90 minute training session where I do some role plan. I talk about the values of intimacy and brotherhood and family which is the embodiment of sports, but when you can kind of shift that paradigm and enter the idea that you can treat your gay a teammate as your brother, right? Um, or someone who's in the front office. And then to complicate it and talk about how sexist language or, or sexism is really the root of homophobia, right? So how do men understand that homophobic language and sexist language can be heard the exact same uh, from their LGBT uh, teammate? And Wade, do you think that the world of professional sports has come far since when you were playing? I mean, I can't think of many professional athletes who've come out as they're playing. I mean, Jason Collins, who played with the NBA, comes to mind, but there haven't been a ton. There hasn't been a wave of athletes coming out, and yet there must be plenty of gay athletes playing professional sports. So, uh, you know, do you think things haven't changed quite enough then? So I would say uh, not just sports hasn't changed enough, our society hasn't changed enough, right? So if there was an athlete now who told the world that he was gay, he would become a gay athlete. The modifier is the problem, which means that the standard is that you're heterosexual. So as long as everyone is assumed to be heterosexual, as long as everyone um, who is perceived as, I mean, who is gay is called a gay NFL player or a gay NBA player and not just an NBA player who is also white or gay or father and, and all of those things, that there will always feel like too much labor that needs to be done by that, that person who identifies as LGBT. 
So what's interesting about the sports world, though, is that there are players who have LGBT brothers. There's there's owners who have LGBTQ um, uh, children, right? Mm -hmm. So the NFL is no different from our larger world. It's just got a different type of microscope. And I know players now who are open to their teammates, who are open to their coaches, who are their father figures and brother figures. But what they don't want to do is tell the world because the world will put a different type of label on them that they truly just don't want. They just want to be a football player who is also gay, not a gay player. Totally understandable. And so in what ways, Wade, do you fear that perhaps sports and the locker room culture around players and sports may naturally promote some of these toxic values that aren't serving men well in other areas of society or even in sports? Yeah, so I would say that any time that you get a group of people together, absent of gender, right, and there is a lack of supervision, right, oftentimes the ugliness comes out of us. and. What we need to teach our boys and our girls is to be courageous enough to be the only one who is speaking up, right? So when I was in high school, college, or the pros, when someone said something that was problematic, very few people had the courage, right, to actually say, hey, that's not okay. I, as an individual, think that your language is problematic and I won't stand for it. We've got to in in inculcate those types of values into our kids so that they aren't afraid to speak up. What I found is that far too many of us would prefer to, to ride the status quo instead of actually building a new type of world or identity. But you know, there are way, there are definitely families that may not have the bandwidth or the resources to raise young men the way they might want to, you know? Um, so in situations like those, is there an opportunity for, let's say, a sports coach or a teacher to help instill those values that might be missing from the home? So I would challenge the, the idea, right, that those values aren't there, right? So I would say that it's, it's not an outcome of poverty that certain groups of people are more or less homophobic. What I would say, it's, a, it's an absence of complicating the actual narrative, right? So for me, I grew up in a two-parent household. Um, we weren't poor, for lack of a better word, you know, as I got older. But what I didn't have is an educational system that valued the other, right? So if we live in, in a world where boys d don't see women as competition, if you look at the fact that out of all of the Fortune 500 companies, there are more men named James than there are women who are CEOs, right? So you're growing up actually watching a world that is privileging men and devaluing women, right? So it's less about the family, right? And the family has a role, right? Because oftentimes the, the first form of sexism you learn is in the home. But if what you're learning in the home is reinforced in our larger world, right? It's a it's an awful cocktail. So. I would say it's it's more of an and both, right? How do we help parents understand that their son isn't more valuable than their daughter? As long as that's the paradigm that we're teaching them, no boy will ever want to exhibit the type of characteristics that, that a girl might have. So you definitely see toxic masculinity as linked to devaluing women. Oh, 100%, right? So if I believe that showing up with the characteristics that have been historically feminine are the worst thing that I can do, mm -hmm. then I have to do everything I can to distance myself from them, which automatically means an us versus them. And what makes masculinity toxic is the fact that I believe that I have to dominate, control, and destroy others in, in order for me to actually be a legitimate man. So, you know, how can we better teach young men how to be themselves, how to also, you know, respect women, how to not be afraid to display interests or qualities that might have previously not been seen as masculine enough. Um, you know, how do we do that as a society? So, and this answer, it may seem simplistic, right, but we've got to see ourselves in the other. So I'll tell you a quick story. When I introduced my mother to my partner, my mother had, in her mind, had zero experience with people who identified as LGBT. So she asked me, she said, well, well when I meet him, what do I say 
to him, right? And I said, you treat him like he's a human being, right? But in her mind, because he identified as LGBT, she had to treat him differently. But what she had to learn, and I'm grateful now that my mother and my partner are thick as thieves, right? But she believed that she had to treat him differently because of his identity, which stripped away everything else about him. When boys grow up believing that girls are different, they see them as different. Mm -hmm. We've got to give boys the tools to be able to see themselves in women. And it seems simple, but when you are raising a son, do you give him books that are about girls, right? Do you give him stories that are not about himself so that he can start to realize that, that there is very little difference between boys and, and, and girls when, when it comes to, to their value, when it comes to how they learn, how they think, how they breathe, how they walk, and how they talk. If there is always a juxtaposition or an intentional clash of those two, then I will always b believe that I have to treat you differently. The Me Too movement, in my opinion, is a gift to men. It gives us an, an opportunity to step back and go, well, wait a minute, would I treat another man this way? Right, wow. Wade Davis, you make some excellent points. Just emphasizing our common humanity goes a really long way. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.